Hello everyone, good morning, uh, it's me again and we will continue the uh, discussion on the politics of international cooperation, kerjasama politik internasional and we discuss this uh, following topic still from Desa Sidomoyo. Sidomoyo village of Godean in the western part of Sleman. Uh, it is in the morning and I do really enjoy uh, this morning. Uh, the sun shines bright and you can hear the birds singing. It's uh, quite relaxing uh, situation quite relaxing moment so hopefully we uh, will enjoy this uh, discussion now today I am going to uh, talk about uh, norm life cycle and international cooperation how norms can boost or promote international cooperation so uh, this is quite interesting because uh, other dominant perspective on international relations uh, telling us that uh, interest or material goals uh, are the main motive for international uh, cooperation. Perhaps also the lobby or the pressure uh, coming from epistemic community can also boost international cooperation now uh, from the perspective of constructivism other than uh, those mechanism uh, norm uh, can be seen as uh, one of the most important tool for international cooperation uh, hence we will discuss about one of uh, important works on this uh, uh, in this uh, tradition of constructivism uh, it will be meeting seven of uh, our course uh, the title is norm life cycle and international cooperation let us move to the first uh, slide solarly work to be discussed uh, norm life cycle uh, has been introduced by uh, two international relations scholar Bu Marta Finemore and uh, Bu Catherine Seeking in 1998 so here in the slide you can uh, see the pictures of them uh, Bu Marta Finemore in the left side and Bu Catherine Seeking in the right side they were giving lecture uh, in the Journal of International uh, Organizations volume 52 number 4 page 887 to 917 I uh, did distribute this um, paper and the article to you so if you have time after this uh, video please to continue to read uh, the article by Bu Marta Finemore and Bu uh, Catherine Seeking very influential and I myself also borrow the theory, the framework of norm life cycle from Bu Finomore and Bu Siki uh, in order to be uh, one of the frameworks in my dissertation. Uh, hence, later when we discuss about the norm life cycle, I will give you uh, the 
uh, some of the uh, findings of my dissertation in order to enrich our discussion. Okay, so next uh, slide here. Uh, I did uh, survey some of uh, the interesting cases using uh, norm life cycle. Of course, uh, the framework here is provided by Finnemore and Seeking in 1998. Uh, they provide the tool to understand the relation between international norm, dynamics, and political change. In th and they introduced three stages of norm life cycle. So, Bu Finomor and uh, Seeking said that uh, this dynamic of international norm uh, or, uh, can be uh, generated from uh, norm creation and its socialization throughout the world. Now, for the case studies, yeah, uh, I uh, really interested. I'm really interested in uh, Bridget Locher's report in 2003, uh, showing how to demonstrate the use of uh, norm life cycle framework to trace the development of international norms of anti-women trafficking in the EU. Uh, it can show us how the norms. Uh, was uh, formulated and advocated throughout the uh, region uh, from state level to uh, regional level and then then it become uh, now become the habit yeah become the culture become the become inter internalized uh, within the European Union uh, mechanism and uh, it's quite successful to introduce uh, this kind of uh, spirit and norms of anti-women uh, trafficking. Now, uh, the other work uh, from Fukuda Bar and who uh, demonstrating the uh, use of norm life cycle framework in the global level through the case of uh, Millennium Development Goals, MDGs, uh, they uh, discuss about how uh, this uh, f uh, what this uh, promotion of uh, development goals uh, can be achieved, how it was discussed in global level what were the debate uh, between those uh, developing countries vis-a-vis -vis developed countries in establishing the, the formulation of MDGs and uh, the st steps of introduction of these MDGs uh, were in very much interesting to be discussed now recently we or the world has changed millennium development goals into sustainable development goals but the case of introducing uh, new norms in international uh, area arena is uh, was interesting to be uh, learned uh, what is the uh, preconditions to the success of an introduction of new norm? Uh, how could you introduce a new norm? Who introduced the norm? What are the motives of those actors? And uh, what is the mechanism, the method to introduce new norms? Yeah, so if we learn, we can learn about uh, these preconditions of success, we can use the, the mechanism in order to promote new norms 
uh, perhaps in the future you know, or no I guess we we know that we have a lot of internet new international norms or new norms that uh, hasn't been internalized in international politics or in domestic politics so if you want to help to introduce the norms and bring it into uh, the next stage of internalization well, you can always refer to the previous works of uh, Bridget Locher, of Budapar and Hume, of Finomor and Seeking. Uh, my dissertation also talking about the same uh, idea of introducing the norm of uh, disaster management uh, cooperation in regional level, which is in ASEAN. Uh, uh, my dissertation uh, will be uh, available uh, online. Now, uh, let us move to the next uh, slide here. Uh, the definition of uh, international uh, dynamics of norms. So, Finnamore and Seeking uh, stated that norm life cycle could help explain how states behavior could be gradually shaped by a new international norm so states behavior can be uh, reshaped so in uh, last two or three meetings we talk about payoff structure of prisoners dilemma in a normal condition the actor will prefer to defect because of the payoff structure the equilibrium the default um, act the default policy preference is the defection both player one and player two in that kind of condition they will always defect rather than cooperate because of the um, payoff structure now scholars like Pierce at all say that if you want to change this default behavior you put longer schedule of the future in order to change the payoff structure so the equation on every quadrant will be changed now seeking infinite more say something else they say you can change the payoff structure put some additional numbers additional variables to the payoff structure by introducing norms so that uh, countries will understand if they will to cooperate if they have this willingness of to cooperate uh, they, they, they will comply to this new norm and the compliance to the new norm gain appreciation gain benefits rather than if defecting this new norm so norm shape this new pair of structure shaping another kind of rationality and finally when it can be internalized it will change state behavior so how to understand the international dynamics of norms seeking and phenomenal say 
in the cycle. A new international norm was formulated in the earlier stage of emergence, reaching critical mass or tipping point, being promoted by state uh, apparatus, and finally being internalized in the bureaucratic habits. That's the um, stages. Later we will we will discuss that with example. Now continue to the next slide here. Uh, we will briefly discuss about norm and rationality or the development of uh, the theory. Also the additional turn of norm. Why people now refer to norm and the origin of an international norm or the process, the staging, the life cycle itself we will discuss and the stages about who introduce this, who promote this norm, uh, what are the motives and how do they do that? the mechanisms okay for uh, the first uh, part norm and rationality so again it's all started from the understanding on game theory rational actor model here stated rational choice theories have been working on problems related to norm based behavior so rational choice theories are agree or they do agree about the extent or the influence of norm some people behave based on norm for example, I am a Javanese. The norm of the Javanese, in order to respect older person, be it my older sisters, perhaps older brothers or older cousins, yeah, or uh, parents, my teachers, uh, my elder in a village the norm is that dictates that I have to speak in chromo the high uh, what rank of uh, Javanese language not the highest the highest is the uh, if we want to talk with Sultan If talking with uh, my friend, the same level, the same age, same position, uh, the colleagues, yeah, we are just use uh, Matteo, yeah, in order to respect. Talking with friends or very close friends or with uh, my younger brothers or sisters or cousins or with students I'll use Moko yeah, usually so that kind of uh, norm uh, is still uh, in fact um, exists in the society quite warm this morning yeah I am sweating now uh, unga ungu yeah in Javanese culture maybe you you guys understand uh, our behavior is shaped 
and not only culture you know, there are so many what about uh, universal norms hmm? such as uh, democracy uh, protection of human rights uh, transparency uh, clean governance rights to tell yeah, uh, rights to pursue uh, happiness freedom of speech freedom of religion that kind of norms are uh, intact uh, exist in our global world and we are supposed supposedly to uh, comply with that kind of norms now social convention here uh, some nest equilibriums are evolutionarily uh, stable in iterated games so uh, because of this social convention uh, will create this corridor for different uh, actors within their rationality uh, inside their calculation uh, will uh, create this uh, stability in an uh, iterated games last time we talked about uh, prisoner's dilemma in one game perhaps you will uh, you have this tendency your rationality leads you to uh, defect but what about if you can assure can be ensured that there will be a longer uh, span of this game so in the next uh, day we will be having another round another round again another round again the very long uh, duration of this game and social convention uh, what can be created yeah so this longer uh, the longer the game you have uh, you create some kind of stability so in prisoner's dilemma uh, in the first round you your rationality leads you to def defect in the second round still both of the actors defecting in the third round uh, maybe one of them would like to invest for the other round so they promote or they try to project this uh, what so called as uh, reciprocated unilater unilateral measure or UM uh, to test the water what if I for the, in this opportunity I'll try to cooperate what will be the outcome how the other actor responds so invest okay I'll cooperate let us wait for the other actor what is the uh, tendency oh perhaps the other actor still defect doesn't matter no worries we will invest okay let us try again in the next round cooperate now the other actor will rethink perhaps oh maybe this guy the other guy want to invest and want to know what we will do okay let's try to uh, reciprocate this goodwill and then later perhaps in round five round six round seven yeah they find this stability of normative construct okay so let's cooperate then the cooperation can be uh, stable creating this social convention 
sometimes not as simplistic as only within five or seven rounds perhaps it took like longer span of time and you keep invest you don't get the outcome that you've expected keep invest perhaps there are dynamics uh, uh, when the administration change after the election you got new president the new pre president think that oh, come on this is not worth of our attention the other actors are still defecting so why not we stop this uh, unilateral measure this kind of dyna dynamics happens even in our real uh, international politics now strategic social construction yeah balancing the maximized utilities and normative commitment now this kind of process will construct a uh, new strategy for all actors different actors and they try to balance actually uh, the maximized utilities and normative commitments always about balancing just like what I've uh, suggested to you to think about the changing of administration new president will rethink about the situation and then to receive new foreign policy it is the under the framework of balancing in the united states of america for example democratic party republican party changing the administration every four or eight years it tried or the people try to see uh, whether the policy of the republics can be sustained or it is the time to change the government yeah so longer time longer span of interaction create social convention and finally also create the need to establish strategic social uh, construction and uh, here the city this situation and this model uh, has forced some of the uh, rational choice theories and the other group international relations expert from constructivist school to have mutual interaction because what they uh, examine is related to uh, each other are related to each other and the preference prior to the instrument of understanding uh, hence uh, some of constructivist scholars also borrow the logic of uh, game theories and also the logic of appropriateness uh, can be a powerful motor can be a powerful dynamo or locomotive for political behavior reshaping yeah? logic of appropriateness to expect other countries and other international actor to behave in accordance with the what so called as what is appropriate yeah logic of appropriateness 
is it appropriate for me to uh, give a lecture yeah uh, with this kind of attire yeah it is uh, appropriate for a country yeah, to uh, let's say uh, neglect the protection of civil and political rights to the minorities it is appropriate for a, a country to let their industry yeah, do uh, production activities that disturb or degrade environment how to act to solve those problems yeah now you are about to refer back to the norms international norms international laws uh, convention protocols that shape how international actors behave this is the ideational turn to norm sorry I need water let us continue to the next slide here the ideational turn uh, of norm the context of this uh, turning tendency of uh, international actor states to come back to norm to refer uh, we were experiencing uh, the Cold War uh, endings and uh, European integration uh, followed by uh, creating uh, of regional blocks ASEAN uh, gaining more relevance so norms becomes uh, more prevalent also the purpose of uh, legitimacy uh, legitimate social purpose uh, such as uh, legitimacy ideology ideology could help uh, people understand about norm so can became tools for legitimacy and we have experienced also the uh, decoloni decolonization uh, the creation or the birth of new nations uh, was part of a normative agenda agenda also many institutional social ends uh, millennium development goals um, sustainable development goals uh, or all uh, normative agendas in our world and political science to be molded as economic or natural science uh, some of the rational theory, rational choice theories game theories that has, has been working with the constructivist uh, scholars uh, also uh, adapt to this kind of mechanism they understand uh, don't have to they they understand they don't have to really uh, change the method in international relations to be in accordance with uh, natural science of course some of them are, are having tendency to understand the phenomenon in a very interpretive interpretative way and also uh, to challenge positivistic uh, approach yeah, but uh, some of them 
uh, understand the utility, the uh, function of game theory and rational choice model. However, uh, we arrive at the conclusion that behavior or the rationality can be influenced by the longer period of duration, the state of the future, also the game changer is the uh, introduction of international norm and its implementation. Hence, all of these uh, factors or uh, historical context uh, push our world towards ideas on our turn to norm. Now, uh, we then uh, move to the next slide, slide number eight, about in general, what is the norm life cycle? How do we bring a uh, norm from scratch to international area and to be implemented in domestic level, in bureaucrat level, institutionalized, internalized? Now, here the graphic uh, quite simple. Norm life cycle begins from its emergence in the very first uh, step. And it has to be pushed towards the tipping point or critical mass if it reaches critical mass successfully then uh, it will uh, arrive at cascading level in a cascading level no one can really challenge and entering the phase of internalization quite simple norm emergence tipping point cascade internalization okay i let you uh, visualize then I will also give you some of the example okay let us go to the next slide international dynamics of norms explain number one about the norm emergence here is the very first beginning of the process, norm formulation, people start to think about the solution of international political or politics problem, then they came up with the solution, one of the solutions is the norm, to set up the norm, Characters characterized by the motive of persuasion. So the norm entrepreneurs that formulate the norm in its emer emerging state will use persuasion to persuade like what Henri Dunant did with the norm of humanitarianism several centuries ago I think 
in the 19th century. He promulgated or proposed, for example, that everyone or the soldiers that get wound on the battlefield have to be treated very well so he tried to uh, promote the Red Cross so the medics uh, or the soldiers with medical qualification to be able to have and it doesn't matter about the sight yeah everyone wounded on the battlefield has to be saved protect protected and uh, this uh, kind of norm in its emergence uh, has been promoted by the norm entrepreneurs it's not become internalized in every country in Indonesia we have Red Cross uh, in Malaysia they have uh, Red Crescent so everyone uh, are familiar already with this kind of no, but before that, yeah, in 19th century, it's not that uh, what well, people uh, had minimum knowledge on that. So the uh, task of the non entrepreneurs to understand or to make them understand. In my dissertation, I wrote about uh, disaster management, regional disaster management cooperation, and at the beginning, uh, those who introduced uh, disaster management was actually people uh, involved in the Great Wars because of the creation of the civil defense. Yeah, and it will evolve into a uh, very important concept uh, in uh, World War, especially World War Two, and has been uh, promoted further. Uh, state involved in wars, then later having, uh, for example, in Great Britain Civil Defense Act of 1948 uh, is a, was a multi-layered uh, disaster management system which include the involvement of local authorities, strategic coordination center, the civil contingency secretariat and cabinet office briefing room, as well as in the United States of America, uh, Federal Civil Defense Act led to the creation of the Federal Emergency Man Management Agency of FEMA. All begins from norm entrepreneurs yeah, to promote uh, and persuade. These norm entrepreneurs uh, work to persuade or influence a critical mass enough supporters uh, of people, national leaders, uh, political parties perhaps, uh, interest groups to adapt to the new norm. So in the case of uh, international norms, of course, uh, what they do is to persuade state leaders to uh, uphold 
this new norm. So in the last uh, meeting, in the last course, we talk about the work of Pak Muhadi and Mas Yunizar Adiputra. At the moment, they can also be considered as norm entrepreneurs, convincing state leaders, foreign ministry to adapt, to understand the logic of this norm against nuclear weapon. So, creating critical mass. And this stage will uh, lead towards the tipping point. I'm sorry, it's too bright. Yeah. Okay, the tipping point. What does it mean? It means that the norm promotion has reached enough critical mass for the norm itself to gain enough supporters to get more exposure in world arena. Now usually, the norm will not reach the topping point until most of the world's countries recognized its importance. So when the population of the world, population of uh, countries in the world started to see and recognize its importance, then tipping point is about to be reached. Seeking in Fenomore says say that minimum requirement for tipping point is 33.33 or about one third of the population. Let's say the population of uh, the world about 200. So you calculate how many countries should support. But also you have to consider the power of that country as well. One third, one third of population is good, but if major powers also in full, it will be stronger, the tipping point. And once the tipping point is reached, it's easier to implement or to create an international regime to support this norm. So, in the case of uh, disaster management, for example, in uh, world level, the tipping point has reached in the on January 18 to 22 in Kobe, in Japan, 2005. World Conference on Disaster Reduction uh, resulted in the Hugo Framework of Action in 2005 and we've, we record, I've uh, calculated that 86.15% of uh, the signatories are supporting the creation of the new norm to help each other in responding to natural disasters 
out of 195 countries. Now in ASEAN, the tipping point has reached in 2005 as well through the ASEAN Agreement on Disaster Management and Emergency uh, Response. 100% of understanding and commitment of ASEAN member states to uh, promote and to support the regional disaster management cooperation 10 out of 10 hundred percent now we move to the next uh, stages two more the next stage is the norm cascade cascade like uh, the terra setting of a waterfall if you have stream streams in your desa in your village kali yang ada undak-undakannya that has kind of waterfall there is that how uh, cascade looks like here in this stage usually states try to persuade so before the norm entrepreneur norm entrepreneurs were the most influential actor now here in uh, norm cascade situation states state leaders become important actor because they will persuade each other yeah states try to persuade other states through socialization and demonstration to demonstrate look i comply with this new norm why don't you comply too or saying that it is better for us to work together to help support this norm in order to create a better world that kind of thing yeah so here uh, the example uh, when uh, the norm of uh, disaster management is being introduced in uh, ASEAN uh, administrations like Lee and Long administration uh, initiated a good office for the initial initial meeting negotiating the ASEAN agreement on disaster management and emergency uh, response uh, in the aftermath of the Indian Ocean tsunami as well as uh, Indonesian administration under Susilo Pambang Yudhoyono uh, allowing uh, PPPT infrastructure PPPT infrastructure in Jakarta to be used as the headquarter of the ASEAN Humanitarian Assistance uh, Center AHA Center in Jakarta and ASEAN Disaster Response Facility as well in West Java uh, to show the um, commitment of state leaders uh, to support yeah, this cascading norm in cascading norm it's difficult for other uh, countries to challenge the importance anymore of the norm let's say for example the human rights yeah when the norm of uh, the norm of human rights uh, has been promoted by more and more countries yeah also the major powers it's already difficult for other countries to debate or to doubt the importance of 
human rights and it's uh, good for its next process yeah in which internalization yeah. actors with different interests are complying the agreements in regards to the norm and formulating a habit now if the norm has become habit and being implemented by the bureaucrats then it has been internalized will be the part or becomes the part of our society yeah actors with different interests albeit they have different interests they all, all agree with this value the norm so in disaster management uh, case for example then we have the AHA center for the operating arms they have this standard operating procedure called SASOC to be implemented throughout ASEAN uh, as a module as a framework on how they have to coordinate and also all ASEAN member countries have their own national disaster management organization and DMOs working together with our center so whenever a major disaster happen they can always contact each other they can always consult to each other and also when we want to deliver aid to certain countries they know how to call they know how is the how the mechanism how to report uh, how to deliver uh, and so on and so forth the technicalities uh, can be solved together can be uh, the infrastructure of cooperation has been established and it has uh, been a daily kind of a routine daily routine for them to coordinate these are all the uh, stages staging of um, the norm life cycle now ASEAN bureaucrats as well also understand that disaster management uh, cooperations are very important and they are willing to do that they willing to innovate to make a betterment of the mechanism it means the sense of uh, ownership on this mechanism has been felt internalized within ASEAN bureaucrats and the professionals those people working in this sector serving the society like of those our heroes in search and rescue teams yeah, or PNPP uh, ASEAN bureaucrats perspective they believe that cooperation uh, has been internalized it is less sensitive matter than issues such as democratization corruption or human rights uh, this is, they also feel that disaster management is a necessity as we need to act quickly at uh, critical moments and uh, lastly uh, ASEAN also needs a tangible result a tangible uh, achievement uh, to showcase the progress of the Southeast Asian Regional Framework. Uh, the list of the N NTMOs working together with ASEAN are many. Uh, all member countries has its focal points uh, in Brunei Darussalam National Disaster Management Center, Cambodia National Committee for Disaster Management, Indonesia the Badan Nasional Penanggulangan Bencana in Lao PDR uh, National Disaster Management Office also Majelis Keselamatan Negara in Malaysia in Myanmar uh, Relief and Settlement Department in the Philippines National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Council and Administrator uh, Singapore Civil Defense Force in, in Singapore in Thailand Department of 
of Disaster Prevention and Mitigation DP, DDPM in Vietnam Department of Dike Management Flood and Storm Control and the Standing Office of Central Committee for Flood and Storm Control yeah so bureaucrats professionals uh, are now the actor for the implementation of the norm now uh, if we summarize the stages the norms the motives the mechanism we will arrive to this last last slide of my presentation today stages of norm life cycle based on Finamore and seeking uh, we took this from page 898 you have columns left column the actors, the motives, and dominant mechanism. And on the upper side, the first row in, in the upper row, uh, representing this, the three stages. Okay, tipping point should be in between stage one and stage two. Stage one, norm emergence. Stage two, norm cascade. Stage three, internalization. Let us take a look one by one. Now, in stage one, the actors are norm entrepreneurs, a person like Andre Dunan, or with organizational platforms like Civil Defense or UNSITR at the United Nations. The motives, altruism, to bring benefits for all of the humankind, empathy, ideational and commitment. So all of these virtues, very noble virtues, are the motives of this norm entrepreneurs and the dominant mechanism is persuasion persuade advocate uh, giving understanding setting the logic is important to connect with knowledge based causal principle beliefs uh, with interest the skill to of persuasion is needed in order to uh, making sense of this new new norm sorry a motorcycle okay now in stage two the actors are states could be state leader could be leading ministry if talking about ASEAN for example uh, AMM ASEAN ministerial meeting also international organizations uh, United States European Union uh, WHO so many international organizations can help and networks uh, such as uh, networks for uh, med medics uh, university networks there's so many networks can that can also contribute now the motives are three of motives legitimacy in order to show that uh, for example state leaders showing that uh, they are working very well and uh, commitment towards progress 
also reputation international reputation um, so that international community can see that uh, we are working together um, in ASEAN for example and esteem self-esteem sometimes the state the state leader to show uh, this um, what sense of uh, contributing towards uh, the betterment of the world governance personal esteem sometimes why not yeah now dominant mechanism through socialization to demonstration by states is very important if you see other states doing already to already comply to this norm why don't you also obey comply with the with the law with the adjacency claims and also institutionalization to create a body that can help coordinate harmonize the implementation of the norm such as for example AHA Center, ASEAN Division on Management, Disaster Management and Humanitarian Assistance yeah. in United States creating UNFCCC uh, and so on and so forth now stage 3 the last stage the actors are already changed from norm entrepreneur state now become the professionals the law lawyers know what to do because they learn about laws and norms the professionals working in many sectors specific sectors different sectors they are all um, believe in this norm yeah and implement it's not uh, about socialization anymore it's about implementation already been uh, applied as a habit in the office and bureaucracy the bureaucrats themselves are the spearhead of norm implementation and the motives conformity compliance to follow the rule yeah so it's completely changed from altruism to self-esteem and now it's all about compliance conformity and the dominant mechanism is institutionalization of course to continue from the setting up in the second stage, we continue to help rebuild uh, and also to solidify the building, the architecture yeah, of this uh, internalized norm and habit. If the norm becomes habit, it's easier to control implement monitor okay so that's all of the material that i want to uh, deliver to you and uh, in order to understand i would like you to imagine merapi mountain or any other mountain it's up to you yeah or a hill now let us imagine this imaginary mountain as the process of norm introduction in the first stage here is the task of the norm entrepreneurs to build a solid norms supported by the valid knowledge valid data to be a very solid ball yeah stone balls if you like to imagine 
Then the non entrepreneurs here wants to push. Yeah. The stone up to the top of the mountain or to the top of the hill. Very hard. Yeah. You know, no entrepreneurs are usually individuals or uh, people in an on organizational platform. Very hard. Yeah. The weight to push this stone. Yeah, so we can understand how hard it is for non entrepreneurs to push the norm. Push, push, push until the top. Yeah. When it finally reaches the tipping point, yeah. Finally. Only need to one more push and it will be cascading. Push, cascade. No one can now really challenge. Well, they can try to challenge, but the stone with the help of the gravity, yeah, will be arrive to the <coughs> to the uh, plain below the mountain now with this kind of situation uh, other state will also follow yeah the stone they are following The, yeah, some of them maybe try to stop the stone. Doesn't work. Very difficult. Until the stone settled. Yeah, on the plain below the mountain. Then everyone gaining benefits of the stone. Perhaps they want to take a rest. On the stone for example yeah so that kind of illustration showing the journey of international norms I illustrate it with mountain stone the people yeah hopefully you can visualize and understand the extent or the influence of norm in international cooperation stone reaching the plane means international cooperation has become the habit the professional the people there will just see the stone, the stone as like what it is yeah hopefully we don't we don't know they don't also take it for granted uh, they should understand the progress uh, the process of introducing this uh, international norm so that they can learn um, uh, best uh, lessons and for us as well uh, so uh, to be you or to be able to use this framework to understand uh, international phenomenon and don't be hesitate to uh, use this framework for your works yeah please let me know do let me know what will you do if you are tasked to use this uh, framework uh, for this uh, meeting we don't have any assignment uh, hopefully after watching this video you can uh, read other um, uh, articles related to norm life cycle if you have time um, for uh, assignment we don't have for for this uh, lecture just enjoy uh, the rest of uh, the day if you have another class please 
uh, be uh, highly spirited uh, have courage have faith uh, it is an universal uh, struggle against COVID-19 yeah uh, no fear no surrender we will reach our victory uh, from Sidomoyo Godean uh, see you later